As a part of the National Hispanic Heritage Month, we are celebrating working through the Oxford Book of Latin American short stories. Today, we are doing one of the most famous short stories from Latin America ever, and that is The Slaughter Yard, sometimes translated as The Slaughterhouse by Esteban Echeverria. Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am not Esteban, I'm Crypto. Now, we will do the best that we can to pronounce names. We do want to try our best, but we we are not Spanish speakers, so we apologize if our accents sound off, if that's not obvious as it is. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> so if you are new to this channel, we go heavy into detail into the books and literature that we read. Today, we are going to try and pull out some of the hidden meanings, and I'm going to tell you... This is not a piece that you grab for plot or characters. This is definitely the allegorical, pol political, social commentary that the Esteban put into this work. Published posthumously in 1871, and it's chronologically the first work of Argentine prose fiction. This has brought techniques to Argentine Confederation, now Argentina, such as European Romanticism, as well as maybe writing about the social political events going on around the world. Uh, the pen is mightier than the sword, if you will. And being one of the most studied works of Latin American literature, it is very strange that it took over 30 years to come out. Well, we got to go back to the Argentine Civil Wars, which took place from 1814 to 1880. During this time period, uh, Argentina didn't exist yet, and this was the Argentine Confederation, which was owned by Spain. And there's a power struggle going on of who will control this colony of Spain. This is post-May Revolution, right? So they've kind of broken away from Spain. And there's questions about how, not only who, but how will it be ru ruled, right? Yeah, being a colony slash confederation, they don't have a very strong government. They don't have a head of state. Uh, Buenos Aires is the pseudo-official capital, and they don't know who's going to be in charge. So some people, when they read this, they'll obviously pick up the word Unitarianism, and it's not the religion to be clear, okay? This is part of what Echeverria was probably writing towards, is this whole federalist versus unitary-based government, form of government, I should say. As you're reading this story, the unitarios or unitarians are going to be representing, I think, the general public of Argentine, Argentina for the time period. The unitarians kind of wanted the central government approach to how they would run the state, as opposed to the federalists who wanted a federalist approach to how you would run the state. If you are confused on those terms, think about if you are in the United States of America, we're a federal government where we're made up of a bunch of state governments that kind of report up. It's not this, it's not the mass, it's not one major government to rule everything. And I think another way you can also kind of think about this is that the federalists are going to be the elites. They're going to be the landowners. They're going to be the rich aristocrats and the Unitarians representing the common man. And they just fought to break away from Spain to get more freedoms. And now they have people locally trying to tell them what to do. And this is going to create that class divide. It's going to create that economic divide. And I think Esteban is writing this story to try to pour some light onto the problems that are happening internally right after a civil war took place for decades. So Juan Manuel de Rosas, he became the caudillo or the warlord or the leader of the area. And he kind of had a rise to power after the May Revolution leading up through the Argentine civil wars. And he was a staunch federalist. There is no questioning about that. And at some point, some people would say a dictator for how he would run the Argentine Confederation. Yeah, he had complete control over the police. It was a police state. Uh, he increased taxes ruthlessly. He had direct control over the church as well and heavy fluence over the local cardinals, bishops, priests, and everyone. Everybody in the pocket. So what is our man Esteban doing with this? And it'd be interesting to go... This is so heavily allegorical. It if we don't touch on everything, I apologize. I don't know everything about Argentine Confederation history. Let's go through what we're able to pull out today. And if that helps you, that's that's great. We just kind of want to start a conversation over this work. Since this is so biographical, so historical, we're going to skip plot and get right into the analysis of the story. But we'll go along in order in a sense, but not necessarily call out the entire plot. But it's interesting that this piece starts off with this biblical and church far like framing. The story takes place kind of during Lent, and it's a time to come closer to God, but we have all of these squabbles and these deluge that the floods are coming back, and basically people are losing crops, agriculture. That's how they survived at this time. 
Yeah, and even calls out many of the the church people here as well. So you might get this feeling that right off the bat, this is going to be a religious piece, and it's actually not. Well, and you'll notice that with the church, he's actually kind of calling them out a little bit with favoritism about the Lent and who should and who should not necessarily partake in it. And this kind of goes in tandem with Rosas and how inconsistent he was in enforcing the law and showed great favoritism towards his friends, family, the heavy, heavy nepotism here by him in Buenos Aires and beyond inside of the church. So is Rosas in the story? Let's talk about this. What is the significance of the deluge and the church controlling meat? So one thing to note here is that the Argentine Confederation is a agricultural society, and it heavy depends on the exportation of their goods to Europe. And there's these imports and exports and these heavy tariffs that are being put on everything. And that is the wealth, and you see the influence bleeding over into other parts of the society. And one thing I want to add in as well, because it's such a heavy agricultural society for our, the Argentine Confederation, is that they rely heavily on slaves. Most slaves were actually transported to the Caribbean and South America, and that heavy slave population is going to come into play when we talk about racism a little bit later. So everybody raise their glass to the restorer who says, death to the savage Unitarians, long live the restorer of the laws. Who could the restorer possibly be in 1838? Juan Manuel de Rosas was nicknamed the restorer of the laws. And he became the Federalist Party uh, leader in the Argentine Confederation, right? Yeah, and this is where we see that uh, Esteban and Rosas are kind of butting heads because he's the head of the Federalists and Esteban will become the leader of the Unitarians and they are at odds at one another of how the country is going to move forward. So there's a lot of sarcasm and irony in which you must use to interpret the way this is written. And you can see that with a popular song with the Federalists is Respolosa, which is means slippery or untrustworthy. And Echeverra uses some incredible imagery, I think, to paint his picture of Rosas as well. He has the one brutal scene in here where there's mud and bloods and guts and intestines everywhere. And I think this is kind of meant to represent Rosas' brutal and barbaric dictatorship and control over the people. All right, so what do you think the significance of the bull and the male testicle scenes were in this? I think we have to go back to the Argentine Confederation it has a lot of its roots in Spanish heritage and culture. And in that culture, the bull represents strength. It represents masculinity. It represents, you know, vitality for these people. And they're just very nonchalant of how the judge and the restorer are just willing to cut down their prized possession to try to make a point to the lesser or, quote, the lesser man people to them. Uh, and that they're you know willing to sacrifice the people almost for their own pride. Well, you'll notice, too, that the bull even ran over like a young European, right? Echeverria was romantic, and he spent some of his most formative years in Europe, and he has some of that romantic uh, elements in his story here and pulls in some of those European ideals as well. What does the hunting down of the Unitarians represent? The Mazurka was created by Rosas during the Revolution of the Restores, and it focused in on basically hunting people down, locating the Unitarians that were opposing the Federalists, and these conspiracies against them to try to bring down his regime. It's kind of like your secret police force that you can use to kind of go above and beyond a brutal dictatorship of silencing those you want silenced, right? Exactly. And we have a great quote from the story here. What nobility of soul, what bravery that of the Federalists, always ganging together and falling like vultures upon the helpless victim. Some some good, good imagery there. And I like how he's, you know, just it's dripping, seething with this like hatred. Oh, yeah. There's no question <laughs> what side of the fence Esteban was on. Now, here's an interesting thing is I, I don't know if you picked up on this. But when like the Mata Siete kind of came onto the scene, he was a man of few words, right? And they have those quotes that are talking about how the Federalists will, will talk, right? No action as opposed to taking action, being adept with skill of the acts and such things. You'll notice that right when they're making fun of the Federalists here almost, that when the Unitarian first appears, there are 12 lines of different Federalists calling him Kerr and... and and what's going to happen when he arrives. It's literally him doing a whole bunch of quick single line statements of saying things but not taking action, which is also very ironic in the way that he leveraged dialogue in this scene too. It's brilliant writing. It really is to be able to throw in those small nuances, to be able to even poke fun at them, and they probably don't even realize it because he is poking fun at their basically intellect. 
Now, later on, they catch the Unitarian and they decide to punish him, right? They, they cut his hair, dress him up like a Federalist, and that's when the judge asks him, now let's see, why don't you wear any insignia? Because I don't care to. Don't you know that the restorer orders it? Insignia become you, slaves, but not f- free men. Free men will have to wear them by force. And I think this is where he's kind of calling out the, they're dressing someone up as a Federalist, acting like a Federalist, but does that really change his behavior? And we have this quote, because I wear it in my heart and memory of my country, which you infamous wretches have murdered. And you can see a little bit of the argument here where finally, if, if, it, if it wasn't clear by now, where what Esteban's stance is on how the government should be organized. Yeah, I also think that Esteban here is calling out what is Argentine's identity going to be? What is our culture going to be? What do you define as an Argentine person? All right, so let's take a quick sidestep here. You mentioned some of the racism earlier. There's no question in my mind that there's racism in this text, right? And it's very different than what we've seen in some of the other texts that we've talked about, race and racism and bigotry. I think that Esteban himself is a racist. He has been conditionalized by his formative time in Europe, being a romanticist, seeing the European heritage as superior to those of Native American or African heritage living in the Argentine Confederation. Now, from my readings, my understanding is Argentina, Argentine Confederation was pushing for Buenos Aires to be kind of like the Paris of of Latin America. They needed to kind of remove the black Afro-Argentines from the area. And being a heavy agricultural area, they couldn't just remove it, right? That, That would immediately destroy their economy if they were to do something like that. And that's when they started using some of the Afro-Argentines in war and other ways to kind of get rid of them. But the idea was that there was a movement to purge Buenos Aires of the Afro-Argentines. And not just them physically as well, but they're trying to purge that idea of that culture and change the language. And they're trying to change the dress. They're trying to change the religion. becomes predominantly, you know, Catholic in that country. There's a lot of subtle moves. And you see, I think, Esteban kind of leaning towards his... Uh, European culture being superior over that of the uh, African Native American uh, culture. Well, clearly, right? He gives them the jobs of picking up the like the scraps of the intestines of the bulls. They're working in covered in blood in the butcher shops, fighting with dogs over scraps. These are clearly positions that are meant to be inferior compared to a lot of the other more glorified elements of the story. And they're frequently referred to in a very derogatory way. Yeah, which is kind of strange because eventually Argentina, when it becomes a country, frees its slaves a lot sooner than other places in South America, through Latin America, and even the United States. Yeah, they we, they freed their 1861, the year that we started the Civil War, right? Exactly. And technically, our slaves won't be freed until 1865. Legally. Legally. There's ob- yeah. Obviously, there's still lots of discussion around the... Uh, the uh, Jim Crow laws there. All right, so what do we think the ending of this piece means? The, the, the man isn't even killed by the Federalists. How do you interpret that? The ending was very strange for me. So Esteban, throughout this whole story, is painting this very grim picture, and he's giving you this very, almost feels like one-sided story, right? This satire-esque story where he's trying to give you this negative view of the Federalists and that they're these terrible, awful people. And at the very end, it's like he pulls the rug from out underneath you. And at the end, the Federalists don't kill the guy. He kills himself. I mean, they push him towards the point of having the aneurysm or his blood vessel burst burst, and him die. But they don't actually kill him. And they say, oh, it was just a joke, man. If he would have just taken it easy, he would have been fine. He'd still be alive. And I feel like Esteban pulled his punches at the end here. And I... I the, it's like almost like he's trying to make a point, but fails a little bit at it, saying that the people are killing themselves by not making the right choices. It's a very strange kind of twist to the end where you think wholeheartedly that the judge and these people are going to kill the guy, right? Yeah, I would have thought so. And the ending did catch me by surprise there, but I like that interpretation. So with that being said, let's move into our ratings here because I kind of struggled with my rating on this one. While historically, I absolutely loved it because I'm a historian and there's some good analytical value here as well. 
uh, it's a very, very strange story, and I'm interested um, in your take on this as well. But I think that I'm just going to give this a solid like 6.5 overall. I'm not going to talk about analytical or my feelings, vice versa. It just it, it it's solid. It it does a job that I think that he wanted to do, uh, but I I don't know. I I struggled with the ending there. It really caught me off guard. Yeah, I I get what you're saying too because. Normally what we do is we'll have an inspectional for pleasure read rating, and then we'll have a analytical side. And honestly, I'm having a harder time with the analytical side because while I know some things about the Argentine Confederation, about what slavery was was portrayed as, at least in, in Latin America, I don't know everything. And I just feel like there's a ton of things that we're missing in our interpretation, and I recognize that. You know what I mean? I re- like I, I'll read lines in this, and I'm like, I know that refers to something, but I'm just not familiar enough with the Latin American history. But that was part of this project too, was to bring us closer and try to understand more about some Latin history, which this clearly achieves. But in terms of enjoyment, yeah, I just didn't really have a great time with it. You know, I think I think the writing was interesting. It was a little weird too for me. I think obviously there's some huge words in here in terms of like vociferation and evisceration where I'm like, I know what these mean, but it's it just... It, it, Something felt strange, and I don't know if it was translation or just the the way he was attempting to portray the Rosa's environment is so barbaric, pushing people into the slaughter yard, controlling the resources, being such a dictator to the land. It was it was clearly not a plot or character piece. This is clearly allegorical and political. So for me, I got to be honest, I'm going to go with like a four for this one overall. Yeah. I think we lose a lot in the interpretation. I think that's got to be it. It's, it. I think the language barrier is a huge thing. I'm glad we did it. I'm glad that we're expanding yeah. our horizons and learning new things. But I think that we lose so much when it goes from one language to another. If maybe we read this and had a little bit better background knowledge, we'd be able to pull a little bit more out of it and maybe enjoy it a little bit more too. Yeah, you got to remember it's over hundreds of years old too. And in a culture that we're not as familiar with as when we read American literature, right? So there's going to be a learning gap there for us, which we're pushing ourselves on to get better. So it achieved in that goal. I'd I'd never claim that we're perfect at this, right? Yeah. But I think the thing too about this piece is that it was something that was controversial. And I think that Esteban did what he set out to do. He gets, uh, you know, ostracized for this. He gets like excommunicated from his country. And I think that we looking back at this historically, it's an important influence piece for the Argentine Confederation and Argentina's history. Well, all right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on today's adventure as we continue through our month of uh, Hispanic and Latin culture short stories. If you're down for literature discussions from all over the world, we're going to be exploring a lot more throughout the years. Please consider hitting that subscribe button to join us on the journey. Una out. Peace.